feels so good to be here in this historic church, the place where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous Vietnam War speech, deploring the Vietnam War, the site of so much bold truth-telling. This is a place where the truth can be told, the whole truth, a truth born of deep and abiding love for all of us each and every one of us, including especially all those who have been locked up, locked out, ushered into a parallel social universe, stripped of basic civil and human rights, ushered into a permanent second-class status, all with the expectation that they will remain forgotten. So I want to thank all of you who are here today, who are here to prove that no one, not one of us, will be forgotten. And to join in this movement for justice, a movement that did not begin today, or yesterday, or last year, but a movement that began when the first slave made his run for freedom. <laughs> believing, believing that another, another life was possible, and believing that it was risking all for. I believe that this movement that has laid dormant in many communities for years, I believe it is a sleeping giant that is about to rise again. But before I get carried away here, I want to pause and say a special thanks to a few of the people who made this event possible. Uh, many, many people ought to be thanked, but I know we don't have time for all of that. So first and foremost, I want to thank Jazz Hayden. Jazz. Where's Jazz? Where are you, Jazz? Jazz contacted me several months ago and told me he had read the book. He had organized a study group comprised of a number of thinkers and leaders from around the city, and uh, that he was answering the call, that he personally was going to see to it that the movement that I call for in the last chapter of the book jumps off right here in New York City. And if anyone is proof that one person can make a difference, it is Jazz. Jazz Hayden is it. Yay! He's one of the people, he's one of the people that's not supposed to amount to anything, that we collectively are supposed to forget about. But after being released from prison, Jazz refused to be cowed by the shame of the felon label, and he stood tall and devoted himself to the work the hard work on behalf of all those who have been forgotten, campaigning for voting rights, for parolees, and for felons, and he became the lead plaintiff in a case challenging disenfranchisement of parolees. And now he's spearheaded the organizing effort to make this event possible. Nobody taught him how to do any of this. He is, as they say, making the way by walking. So please give a round of applause to Jazz Hayden. And I also want to thank Reverend Stephen Phelps, the interim senior minister here at Riverside. Reverend Phelps was one of the first people in the faith community, a faith leader, who reached out to me and contacted me after the book was first released. This was before he had come to Riverside. He wrote me and told me that he was deeply moved by the book and sent me a link to an audio recording of a sermon he had delivered based on the book. And I listened to it, and it nearly brought me to tears. And I was blown away, and I immediately wrote him back and said, thank you, thank you for giving this book a soul. And Reverend Phelps said, whatever you need me to do in this movement, just say the word. Well, several months later, he comes to Riverside Church, where, quite by coincidence, Jazz Hayden is toiling away with his study group and organizing an event around the Jim, new Jim Crow. And I myself don't believe much in coincidences, and so I want to thank God for bringing us all here today to do the work that the freedom fighters who came before us had only just begun. We have our work cut out for us. 
Appearances in America are very deceiving, lulling people to sleep about what has really been going on. It does look good from a distance. There's Barack Obama, our nation's first black president, standing in the Rose Garden, looking handsome, dignified, and in charge. Flip the channel and there's Michelle Obama, a brown-skinned woman, digging a garden in the backyard of the White House, not as a servant or as a maid, but as the first lady, schooling the nation on how to be good stewards of our planet and how to take better care of ourselves and our families. Flip the channel again and there's the whole Obama family exiting Air Force One, descending the flight of stairs, a gorgeous black family living in the White House, rule in America, cheered by the world. Then you drive a few blocks from the White House and you find the other America. You're wondering what wrong turn was made and how you managed to miss the promised land, though you had reached for it with all your might. A vast new racial undercast now exists in America, though their plight is rarely mentioned on the evening news. Obama won't mention it. The Tea Party won't mention it. Media pundits would rather talk about anything else. The members of the undercast are largely invisible to most people who have jobs, live in decent neighborhoods, or zoom around in freeways past the literal and virtual prisons in which they live. Many people are reluctant to admit it, but today in the so-called era of colorblindness, and yes, even in the age of Obama, something much like a caste system is alive and well in America. The mass incarceration of poor people of color today is tantamount to a new caste system when specifically designed to address the social, political, and economic challenges of our time. It is the moral equivalent of Jim Crow. Now, there was a time, there was a time I have to confess that I rejected this kind of talk. I thought people who made comparisons between mass incarceration and Jim Crow or mass incarceration and slavery were engaging in exaggerations, distortions, hyperbole. In fact, I thought people who made those types of comparisons we're actually doing more harm than good to efforts to reform the criminal justice system and achieve greater racial equality in the United States. But what a difference a decade makes. For after years of representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement in poor communities of color and attempting to assist people, quote unquote, re-enter into a society that never seemed to have much use for them in the first place, I had a series of experiences that began what I call my awakening. I began to awaken to a racial reality that is so obvious to me now that what seems odd in retrospect is that I had been blind to it for so long. I state my basic thesis in the introduction where I write, quote, what has changed since the collapse of Jim Crow has less to do with the basic structure of our society than the language we use to justify it. In the era of colorblindness, it is no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. So we don't. Rather than rely on race, we use our criminal justice system to label people of color criminals and then engage in all the practices that we supposedly left behind. Today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways in which it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Once you're labeled a felon, the old forms of discrimination, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote, and exclusion from jury service, suddenly legal. As a criminal, you have scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America, we have merely redesigned it. Now, like I said, I reached this conclusion reluctantly. I resisted it. But over the course of some years, I had an awakening. And there were a number of experiences that helped to open my eyes and admit what was really going on. 
but one in particular I will never forget. It involved a young African-American man, probably no older than 19. He walked into my office, actually my conference room, one day while I was the director of the Racial Justice Project for the ACLU in California. We had launched a major campaign against racial profiling. We called it the Driving While Black or Brown campaign. It eventually became a national campaign of the ACLU. And we had put up billboards with hotline numbers for people to call if they had, you know, if they believed they had been stopped or targeted by the police on the basis of race. And we had already sued the California Highway Patrol for racial profiling and their drug interdiction practices, but we were planning to sue other law enforcement agencies in the Bay Area as well. And this young man comes into my office. I'm spending my afternoon interviewing one young black man after another who's been stopped, searched by the police for no apparent reason other than race. He comes into my conference room and he's got a stack of papers like this. He has documented a pattern of stops and searches that he's experienced over a period of nine months with extraordinary detail. He has times, dates, witnesses, names of officers, in some cases badge numbers, extraordinary amount of detail documenting a pattern of discrimination he experienced in his neighborhood. And on top of that, he was a good-looking young man. He was well-spoken and charismatic, and I thought to myself, this is my dream plaintiff. This is, this is the one we've been waiting for. And so I'm talking to him, getting excited, and then he says something that has me pause. And I said, wait, did you say, did you, did you just say you're a felon? You're a drug felon? And he gets quiet, and he says, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I, yeah, I have a felony, I have a drug felony, but listen, I was framed, I was set up, the police planted drugs on me, and they beat up me and my friend, and he starts telling me this big, long story about how he was set up, and the police planted drugs on him, and this whole long thing, and I just, I stopped listening, I just, you know what, I'm sorry, we cannot represent you if you have a felony. The media will be all over you saying, of course the police should be keeping an eye on you because you have a felony, that you're exactly the kind of guy they should be stopping and searching. We can't put you on the stand. They'll use your criminal record against you on the stand. I'm so sorry, but we're just, we're not gonna be able to represent you. And he becomes increasingly agitated trying to explain and then he becomes enraged. And he says to me, you're no better than the police. Minute I tell you I'm a felon, you just stop listening. You can't even hear what I have to say. He says, what's to become of me? I can't get a job. I'm living in my grandma's basement right now because nowhere else will take me in. I can't even take care of myself as a man. I can't even get food stamps today. What's to become of me? What's to become of me? He says, good luck trying to find one young black man in my neighborhood they haven't gotten to yet. They've gotten to us already. You're no better than the police. And he snatches those papers and starts ripping them up, little pieces, throwing them around the conference room, walking out saying, you're no better than the police. He takes off. Well, several months after that, I'm doing a public access television show in his neighborhood. We were in the process of trying to organize several thousand people to attend a demonstration protesting then Governor Davis's refusal to sign racial profiling legislation. And we were organizing thousands to get on buses and go to this demonstration. So I'm doing a live public access television show out of his neighborhood. And as soon as the show ends, he bursts in carrying this dirty plotted plant. And he forces it into my arms. And he's emotional, nearly on the verge of tears. And he says, I'm here to just say I'm sorry I'm sorry, I see you out there working for our people. I shouldn't have treated you that way. I shouldn't have treated you with that disrespect. I'm here to say, I'm sorry. I would have bought you some flowers, but I'm still living at my grandma's. I snatched this plan off of her front porch here. <laughs> hands me, hands me the plant, turns around and runs away. I chase after him. He jumps into a big beat down car and disappears. Several months after that, I'm in my office, open up my newspaper, and what's on the front page? The Oakland Riders police scandal is broken. Turns out that a gang of officers, otherwise known as a drug task force, had been roaming his neighborhood, planting drugs on people, beating suspects up, and who is identified as the main officer 
but the officer he had identified to me as having planted drugs on him and beat him up and his friend. And that's when the light bulb in my head finally started to go on, and I said to myself, he's right about me. I am no better than the police. The minute he told me he was a felon, I stopped listening. I couldn't hear what he had to say. And that was the beginning of me beginning to ask myself some hard questions as a civil rights lawyer. How was I actually replicating the very forms of discrimination, exclusion, and marginalization that I was supposedly fighting against? And I also started to question our strategies. I shouldn't have woken up just because he was innocent. The point was, is that there are millions of folks whose voices aren't being heard and whose stories are not being told because they've been branded criminals, branded felons. And we, as a nation, have decided they are unworthy of our care and concern. And that was the beginning of my journey of listening more carefully to the stories of people cycling in and out of prison and also doing an enormous amount of research to try to understand why was it that we hadn't been able to find one young black man in his neighborhood they hadn't gotten to yet. What was really going on? And what I learned over those years blew my mind. I discovered that most of what I thought I, I, thought I knew about the criminal justice system was sheer myth. Here are the facts, a few of the facts I uncovered in the course of my work that I describe in the book. More African American adults are under correctional control today in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War began. In 2004, more black men were disenfranchised than in 1870 the year the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting laws that deny the right to vote explicitly on the basis of race. Now, of course, during the Jim Crow era, poll taxes and literacy tests operated to keep black folks from the polls. Well, today, felon disenfranchisement laws accomplish what poll taxes and literacy tests ultimately could not. And today, a black child born today has less of a chance of being raised by both parents than a black child born during slavery. Wow. Now this is due in large part to the mass incarceration of black men. There was an interesting article published in The Economist magazine about this not too long ago entitled How the Mass Incarceration of Black Men Harms Black Women. And in the article it described that the majority of black women in the United States including about 70% of black professional women are unmarried. And that this is due largely to the mass incarceration of black men, which takes them out of the dating pool at the years they would be most likely to commit to a partner, to raising a family. But what's worse is that by branding them criminals and felons, they're rendered permanently unemployable in the legal job market for the most part virtually guaranteeing that most of them will cycle in and out of prison, sometimes for the rest of their lives. In this way, mass incarceration has decimated black families to a degree comparable to slavery. Now, in some major urban areas, more than half of working age African Americans of working age have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. Let me correct that. More than half of working age black men in many urban areas have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. These men are part of a growing undercast, not class, caste, a group of people defined largely by race who are relegated to a permanent second-class status by law. Now, I find that when I tell people often that I think mass incarceration is like a new Jim Crow, people usually react with a shock disbelief. They say, well, how can you say that? How can you say that? Just look at Barack Obama. 
You know, just look at Condoleezza Rice. Just look at Oprah Winfrey. Just look at Colin Powell. And the list goes on and on of highly successful, you know, African Americans who have achieved great wealth, power, or fame as proof that nothing like a caste system could possibly be existing in the United States today. Well, I think it's important to bear in mind that no caste system in the United States has ever governed all African Americans. There have always been free blacks and black success stories, even during slavery and Jim Crow. No, during slavery, there were some black slave owners. Not many, but some. And during Jim Crow, there were some black lawyers and black doctors, not many, but some. Now, the extraordinary nature of individual black achievement in formerly white domains certainly does suggest that the old Jim Crow is dead, but it doesn't necessarily mean the end of racial caste. If history is any guide, it may have just taken a different form. I think any honest observer of American racial history has to acknowledge that the rules and reasons the legal system employs for enforcing status relations evolve and change as they're challenged. In the first chapter of the book, I describe the cyclical rebirths of racial caste in America. Since our nation's founding, African Americans have repeatedly been controlled through institutions like slavery and Jim Crow, which appear to die but then are reborn in new form, tailored to the needs and constraints of the time. For example, following the Civil War, a new system of control emerged to replace slavery called convict leasing. Many people don't realize that after the Civil War, black men were arrested in mass. It was our nation's first prison boom. They were arrested for extremely minor crimes like loitering and vagrancy. They were arrested, sent to prison, and then leased to plantations. Sometimes the very plantations from which they had been freed or their parents had been freed. Now, the idea was that they were supposed to earn their freedom, but the catch was they could never earn enough to pay back the plantation owner the cost of their food, clothing, or shelter to the plantation owner's satisfaction, and so they were effectively re-enslaved, sometimes for the rest of their lives. Douglas Blackman has written an excellent book about this phenomenon called Slavery by Another Name, about the rebirth of slavery in the South following the Civil War. Well, I believe our criminal justice system has been used once again to effectively recreate caste in America. Now, I'm sure there's at least one person, probably more, in this room who's thinking, what is she talking about? Our criminal justice system isn't a caste system, it's a system of crime control. The black folks would just stop committing so many crimes, they wouldn't have to worry about being rounded up, locked up, and stripped of their basic civil and human rights. And therein lies the biggest myth about mass incarceration, namely that it's been driven by crime or crime rates. It's not true. It's absolutely not true. Our prison population quintupled in 30 years, went from about 350,000 to well over 2 million for reasons that have stunningly little to do with crime or crime rates. Over the past 30 years, crime rates have fluctuated, have gone up, have gone down. Today, as bad as they are in many parts of the country, crime rates are actually at historical lows. But incarceration rates have consistently soared, especially black incarceration rates. Most criminologists and sociologists today will acknowledge that crime rates and incarceration rates in the United States have moved independently of one another. Incarceration rates have soared regardless of whether crime is going up or down in any given community or the nation as a whole. So what does explain this explosion in incarceration in black and brown incarceration in the United States, if not crime rates? Well, the answer is the war on drugs and the get tough movement, the wave of punitiveness that washed over the United States. In fact, drug convictions alone accounted for about two-thirds of the increase in the federal system and more than half 
of the increase in the state system between 1985 and 2000, the period of the drug war's greatest escalation. Now, to get a sense of how large a contribution the drug war has made to mass incarceration, consider this. There are more people in prison and jail today just for drug offenses than were incarcerated for all reasons in 1980. Drug convictions have increased more than 1,000% since the drug war began. And here in New York City, where possession of marijuana is supposedly decriminalized, more than 50,000 people were arrested for marijuana possession just last year. 500,000, 536,000 people have been arrested for marijuana possession since 1996 sweeping extraordinary numbers of people into the criminal justice system right here in a city that has supposedly decriminalized marijuana possession. Now, most Americans violate drug laws in their lifetime. Most do. But the enemy in this war has been racially defined. The drug war, not by accident, has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color despite the fact that studies have now shown for decades that people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites, or sell. Now that defies our basic stereotype of who a drug dealer is, as some you know, black kid standing on the street corner with his pants sagging down. And plenty of drug dealing happens in the hood, but it happens everywhere else in America as well. A kid living in rural Kansas doesn't drive to the hood to get his marijuana, or his meth, or his cocaine. No, he gets it most likely from someone of his own race down the road. In fact, where significant differences in the data can be found, they frequently suggest that white youth are more likely to engage in illegal drug dealing than black youth. But that's not what you would guess by taking a peek inside our nation's prisons and jails, which are overflowing with black and brown drug offenders. In some states, 80 to 90% of all drug offenders sent to prison have been African American. Now, here in New York City, thanks to stop and frisk tactics in poor communities of color, where police sweep neighborhoods, stopping, interrogating, frisking folks without any reasonable suspicion of actual criminal activity, Young folks of color are often caught with a small amount of marijuana, arrested, sent to jail, and saddled with a criminal record that will follow them for the rest of their lives. Now this didn't happen to Barack Obama when he used marijuana and cocaine. No, because he did so at predominantly white universities where these stop and frisk tactics don't ever occur. But if you're not living in a middle-class white neighborhood, if you're not on a college campus or you know, university insulated from the tactics of this war, if you're living in the hood, your odds of going to jail are sky high for engaging in exactly the same kind of behavior that goes ignored on the other side of town. These stop and frisk tactics are a big part of the reason that over 90% of this city's adult detention population is black or Latino, and about 95% of the juvenile population. Now, I find that many people are willing to concede these racial disparities once they see the data, but even so, they say, well, this drug war, these tactics, they have a benign motive. You know, it's motivated over concern about violent crime. You know, it makes sense to wage the drug war in these ghetto communities, because that's where all the violent offenders and drug kingpins can be found. Indeed, most people seem to think that the war on drugs was declared in response to the emergence of crack cocaine in inner city communities and the related violence. For a long time, I believed it too, but it's not true. President Ronald Reagan officially declared the current drug war in 1982 at a time when drug crime was actually on the decline not on the rise. The war was declared before, not after, crack hit the streets and ravaged poor communities of color across America. President Richard Nixon was the first to coin the term 
a war on drugs, but it was President Ronald Reagan who turned that rhetorical war into a literal one. And at the time he declared that war, drug crime was actually on the decline, not on the rise. Now why declare a drug war when drug crime's on the decline and less than 2% of the American population identifies drugs as its most pressing concern? Well, the answer is that from the outset, the drug war had very little to do with actual concern about drug abuse or drug crime and nearly everything to do with racial politics. Numerous historians and political scientists have now documented that the war on drugs was part of a grand political strategy adopted by the Republican Party known as the Southern Strategy of using racially charged get tough appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to poor and working class whites, particularly in the South, who were resentful of, anxious about, threatened by many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. Now, to be fair, you know, we have to admit that poor and working class whites really had their world rocked by the civil rights movement. Wealthy whites could send their kids to private schools, could give their kids all the advantages that wealth has to offer. But poor and working class whites were faced with a social demotion. It was their kids who might be bused across town to a school they believed was inferior. It was their kids, not the wealthy white kids, their kids who were going to be suddenly forced to compete on equal terms for scarce jobs with this whole new group of people they've been taught their whole lives to believe were inferior to them. This fear and resentment and anxiety created an enormous political opportunity. In fact, in the words of H.R. Haldeman, President Richard Nixon's former chief of staff, he described the strategy as, quote, the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to, end quote. Well, they did. A couple years after the drug war was announced, crack hit the streets in inner city communities, and the Reagan administration seized on this development with glee, actually hiring staff whose job it was to publicize inner city crack babies, crack dealers, the so-called crack whores, and crack-related violence in the hopes of making crack a media sensation, which they believed would bolster public support for a drug war they had already declared and persuade Congress to devote millions more dollars to waging it and the plan worked like a charm. Almost overnight, television sets were saturated with images of black and brown drug users, crack babies, crack whores, crack-related violence, and a wave of punitiveness washed over the United States. Harsh mandatory minimum sentences for drug laws and other offenses swept the United States, and soon Democrats began competing with Republicans to prove they could be even tougher on them than their Republican counterparts. And so it was President Bill Clinton, who was once dubbed our first black president, it was President Bill Clinton who escalated the drug war far beyond what his Republican predecessors even dreamed possible. And it was the Clinton administration that championed laws banning drug offenders even from food stamps for the rest of their lives banning them from public housing, denying them federal financial aid for schooling upon release. To a large extent, it was the Clinton administration that championed the very laws that constitute the basic architecture of this new caste system, all in an effort to win back those so-called white swing voters, the Reagan Democrats, the folks who had defected from the Republican Party, I mean, from the Democratic Party in the wake of the civil rights movement. And so now here we are, decades later, and millions of people of color are cycling in and out of our criminal justice system, permanently locked up and locked out. But still, some folks say, well, this is a regrettable necessity We've got to do something about those drug kingpins and those ghetto communities. But this drug war has never been focused on rooting out violent offenders or drug kingpins. Never. 
Federal funds have flowed to those state and local law enforcement agencies that boost dramatically the sheer numbers of drug arrests. It's a numbers game. They haven't been rewarded in cash for bringing down the drug kingpins or the most violent offenders. No, they've been rewarded in cash for the sheer numbers of people swept into this system. And the results are quite predictable. 2005, for example, it was reported that four out of five drug arrests were for simple possession, only one out of five were for sales. In 1990s, the Clint years, the greatest escalation of the drug war, nearly 80% of the increase in drug arrests were for marijuana possession, a drug less harmful than alcohol or tobacco, and at least as prevalent in middle class, white communities and on college campuses as it is in the hood. But by waging this drug war almost exclusively in the hood, we've managed to rebirth a caste-like system in America. Now I know time's running short and I want to hear from the panelists as well, but I just want to identify a few of the most obvious parallels between mass incarceration and Jim Crow and say a few words about what we can do to end this system. The most obvious similarity, of course, is denial of the right to vote. You know, 48 states in the District of Columbia deny prisoners the right to vote, but that's just the tip of the iceberg because, you know, once you're released, you can be denied the right to vote for a period of years or the rest of your life. And here in the United States, we treat that as normal. People shrug their shoulders at that. But in other Western democracies, in other European democracies, prisoners have the right to vote and there's voting drives in prison. But here in America, we take the idea of democracy a little less seriously. And in some states, you can be denied the right to vote for the rest of your life because you were once branded a felon. Exclusion from jury service. You know, one hallmark of the old Jim Crow system were the all-white juries, particularly in the South and the automatic exclusion of blacks from the juries. Well, today, if you're branded a, a felon, you're deemed ineligible for jury service for the rest of your life. And then if you've ever had a negative experience with law enforcement, you can be struck from a jury for cause. Good luck finding many folks in poor communities of color who have not yet had a negative experience for, with law enforcement that would justify their exclusion from a jury for cause. All white juries have been having a roaring comeback in many parts of the country that are quite diverse because of the system of mass incarceration, rendering so many outside of what we understand to be those who are full-fledged citizens. Employment discrimination. Virtually every job application's got that box you gotta check, asking the dreaded question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Doesn't matter if that felony happened three weeks ago or 35 years ago, for the rest of your life, you've gotta check that box. I'm a felon. Knowing full well that the odds are sky high, your application's going straight to the trash. Housing discrimination is perfectly legal against people with felons. You're barred from public housing for a period of years when you're released from prison and you can be legally discriminated against for the rest of your life in both the public and private housing markets if you have a criminal record. Public benefits may be off limits to you. As I mentioned before, under federal law, food stamps are off limits to people with drug offenses. Fortunately, many states have opted out of the federal food stamp ban but thousands of people can't even get food stamps because they were once caught with drugs. What do we expect folks to do? You're released from prison, can't get a job, you're barred from housing. In fact, if you try to go home to your children or to your partner who's living in public housing, they risk eviction for allowing you to come home. Food stamps may even be off limits to you, you can't feed yourself. What do we expect folks to do? Well, apparently what we expect them to do is to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, which continues to accrue while you're in prison. And then in a growing number of states, you're expected to pay back the cost of your imprisonment. And then get this, if you're one of the lucky few who actually manages to get a job, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished. 
to pay back all those fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support. What are folks expected to do? I say, what is this system designed to do? It seems designed to send folks right back to prison, which is what in fact happens the majority of the time. Most people released from prison return, and the majority who do, do so in a matter of months because the challenges associated with mere survival are so immense. Even so, many people tell me that's not even the worst of it. Many people who've been branded criminals and felons say all of that, all those formal barriers to inclusion, that's not even the worst of it. The worst is that shame and stigma that follows you for the rest of your life. The shame of having to beg your grandma to sleep in her basement at night because nowhere else will take you in. It's not just the denial of the box, but that look that flashes across the employer's face time and time again when he sees, oh, that box has been checked. It's that shame that causes so many people, branded criminals and felons, to try to pass. You know, during the old Jim Crow, light-skinned blacks would try to pass as white to avoid the shame and stigma of race. Well, today, people branded criminals and felons try to pass not just by lying to housing officials and to employers by failing to check the box, but by lying to friends, to family members, to loved ones, trying to keep it quiet so nobody really knows. There was a fascinating ethnographic study done in Washington, D.C. of neighborhoods hard hit by mass incarceration. I mean, these are neighborhoods where every house or apartment or every other house has a family member who's either currently behind bars who has recently been released from prison. Neighborhoods where you would think that incarceration was just so normal, everybody would be talking about it all the time. Who's in and who's out? They couldn't find one person in these neighborhoods who had fully come out to their friends, neighbors, and loved ones about their own criminal history or that of their loved ones. Child, when asked, so where's your daddy? Oh, my daddy? Mm, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure where my daddy is. I haven't seen him for a while. Knowing full well that father's in prison. People ask, oh, people are asked by a relative family, wait, where's Uncle Troy? Where's, where's Uncle Troy? Oh, Uncle Troy, he's out of town. He's out of town. Oh, well, when will he be back? Mm, hard to say. Hard to say. Don't, not sure. People asked, oh, where have you been? I haven't seen you. Gosh, it must have been years since I've seen you. Where have you been? Oh, yeah, I, I've, been, I've been doing a little of this, doing a little of that. I've got to go now. got to run. I'll talk to you later. That shame and stigma has kept the communities, our communities, the communities hardest hit by mass incarceration, ashamed, silent, and divided. And this shame and blame makes collective political action next to impossible. So what do we do? Well, one day I believe historians will look back on the era of mass incarceration and they will say it was there, right there at the prison gates, that we abandoned Dr. King's dream and veered off the trail he had blazed. We took a detour, a tragic U-turn, that would result in millions of African Americans permanently locked up and locked out. We have now spent a trillion dollars, one trillion dollars, on the drug war since it began. Funds that could have been used for schools, economic investment in our poorest neighborhoods, for job creation, for small businesses. A trillion dollars could have been used to promote our collective well-being. Instead, those dollars pave the way for the destruction of countless lives, families, and dreams. So what do we do? Where do we go? Well, my own view is that nothing short of a major social movement has any hope of ending mass incarceration in America. Now, if you doubt, if you doubt such a movement is necessary, Consider this, if we were to return to the rates of incarceration we had in the 1970s, before the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement kicked off, we would have to release four out of five people who are in prison today, four out of five. A million people employed by the criminal justice system could lose their jobs. 
Private prison companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange should be forced to watch their profits just poof, vanish. This system, this system is not going down, is not going to just fade away without a major upheaval, a dramatic shift in our public consciousness. Now, there are those who say there's no hope of ending mass incarceration in America. Just as many were resigned to Jim Crow in the South, today, many people view the millions cycling in and out of our nation's prisons and jails as an unfortunate but inalterable fact of American life. Now, I know that Dr. King and Ella Baker and Sojourner Truth and the many other freedom fighters who came before us would not have been so easily deterred. And it's time for us to pick up the baton. We must be willing to continue the work. We must, we must be willing to go back and pick up where they left off and continue the hard work of movement building on behalf of poor people of all colors. In 1968, Dr. King told advocates that the time had come to transition from a civil rights movement to a human rights movement. Meaningful equality, he said, meaningful equality could not be achieved through civil rights alone. Basic human rights must be honored, the right to work, the right to housing, the right to quality education for all. Without basic human rights, civil rights are an empty promise. So in honor of Dr. King and Ella Baker and all those who labored to bring an end to the old Jim Crow and the old caste systems, I hope we will commit ourselves to building this movement to end mass incarceration, a human rights movement, a movement for education, not incarceration, for jobs, not jails, a movement to end discrimination against those released from prison, discrimination that denies them their basic human rights to work, to housing, to food. What must we do to build this movement, this movement that has been living in the hearts and souls of our people for so long? That's a question I'm often asked. Well, first, we've got to start telling the truth, the whole truth. It's an unpopular truth. It's America's most inconvenient truth, but is the truth nonetheless. We've got to be willing to break the silence. We've got to admit out loud that we as a nation have managed to rebirth a caste system in America. And we've got to start admitting our own criminality out loud so that those who are returning home from prison are not so isolated and stigmatized. Truth is, we're all criminals. All of us. If you're an adult, you've broken the law at some point in your lives. You drank underage. You drank underage. You may have experimented with drugs, illegal drugs. Or, you know, I often say if the worst thing you've ever done in your unadventurous life is speed 10 miles over the speed limit on the freeway, you've put yourself and others at more risk of harm than someone smoking marijuana in the privacy of their living room. But there are people, there are people in the United States doing life sentences for first time drug offenses. The United States Supreme Court in a case called Harmland versus Michigan ruled that it is not unconstitutional. It does not violate the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment to impose life imprisonment on a first time drug offense, even though such a thing is virtually unheard of anywhere else in the world. So we've got to start ending this us versus them, that we're going to help those criminals who aren't us. All of us are sinners. All of us have made mistakes. All of us are criminals. And the question is, are we willing to still love one another despite our failings and our mistakes? Now, I want to be clear. I want to be clear that when I'm talking about love, I'm not talking just about love for those people who have committed crimes 
like we may have committed, you know. I'm not talking about caring about or loving people who have committed crimes that we think not so bad. I'm talking about the kind of care and love that keeps on loving no matter who you are or what you have done. It's that kind of love that is needed to build this movement. Because we've got to build an underground railroad. We've got to build an underground railroad for people returning home from prison. Helping to save people one by one. Helping them find food and shelter and work. But just like during the days of slavery, it wasn't enough to build an underground railroad. You had to work for abolition. Today, it's not enough to help folks one by one. We've got to work to end this system of mass incarceration. All of it. A human rights movement has to be born, one that takes seriously the basic humanity and dignity of all people. Yes, all people. This movement must be multiracial, multi-ethnic, and include poor and working class whites, a group that's consistently pit against poor folks of color, triggering the rise of successive new systems of control. This punitive impulse that swept the nation had its roots in racial anxiety, fear, and resentment. It was born with black folks in mind. But people of all colors, are suffering and have been harmed by this war. So if we're gonna succeed in bringing this system to an end, we've gotta map the linkages between the suffering of African Americans in the drug war to the experiences of immigrants that are now being housed in cages. We are gonna to have to map, the, and map and connect the dots between all the forms of discrimination and suffering as a result of the indifference we have to the others in this nation. But before this movement can get underway, a great awakening is required. We've got to awaken from our colorblind slumber to the realities of race in America. And we've got to embrace those labeled criminals, not necessarily all their behavior, but them, their humanness. For it has been the refusal and failure to recognize the basic dignity and humanity of all people that has formed the sturdy foundation for every caste system that has ever existed in the United States or anywhere else in the world. It's our task, I firmly believe, to end not just mass incarceration, but to end this history and cycle of caste in America. Thank you so much for having me.